Check, check, check. Okay, shit. What's up, guys? Hey. You've been here uh, all day, I guess, listening to people talk about production and stuff. Are you guys new producers? Most of you guys? No? no? Fuck, fuck those guys. Not new producers. <laughs> you guys have uh, been producing for a while. How many of you guys are just producers by a show of hands, right? Okay. What the hell are the other people doing? What are you guys doing? Are you guys DJs, I guess? Just want to throw it out. <laughs> this could be a really short presentation. We could all just take a big uh, photo and I could get the hell out of here. That would be a uh, no, I'm just kidding. All right, guys. Well, I did, uh, I did prepare a little bit. Today, I'm going to talk to you about... Uh, nice. Um, about some of the geeky, more technical stuff, but I'll try not to make that too long. And I'll give you some of my philosophy on, uh, on, on being a, an artist, because I do have a lot of uh, thoughts about that. Me personally, I, uh, I was in a group before I started Kashmir that was called the Cataracts, and we produced hip hop music, and we, we did pop music, and we did that song Like a G6 about the popping bottles in the ice and like a blizzard and you know all that stupid stuff and uh, so that that was probably like 2011 so that was like seven years ago for me and uh, I found a lot of success uh, producing the G6 song and then that sort of catapulted me into a bunch of different uh, pop sessions with guys like Justin Bieber and uh, you know Jason Derulo and Robin Thicke and, and all these kind of guys but I would, it was a little bit strange and, and happened all at once and then I realized very quickly that with the success of G6 I was making songs about popping bottles and all of this stuff that really had nothing to do with my identity and uh, the cataracts ended and when I thought about what I wanted my legacy to be and what I wanted to be written on my t tombstone I came up with Kashmir because that's my heritage and I, I grew up and my family always said Oh, you're a Kashmiri, this. You know, when you're young and you're in America, I didn't really give much attention to my Indian heritage. I just wanted to fit in. I, I was like, man, my dad's this guy with a funny accent. All my friends make fun of him. And so, uh, but when I uh, actually got sent to India because I didn't want to go to college, so I was going to live with my grandpa, and he was going to teach me that basically music was a stupid the hobby. And I spent the summer there, I spent a couple months with my grandpa. And that's when I really got close to India and it always stuck with me. And then when it came time to create a new artist project after the cataracts, I started Kashmir. And that was much more in line with what I wanted to be written in my tombstone, I guess you could say, like what something I'd be proud of. So the advice that I would give to people that are starting out and being an artist is, um, first of all, the really big guys like Justin Bieber and Garrix and stuff, I would just get that out of your mind completely. Um, it, it's, you know, it's, it's possible for you. Uh, they have like nonstop hits and good looks and I just don't know shit about that or succeeding like that. So I'm just not gonna try to teach you that. Uh, but I do think if you create an artist project that is sort of like the hero in your own movie, someone that you respect, I think you can get really, really far. And that was, I mean, not to give myself too much credit, but uh, with the Kashmir thing, because you can decide for yourself if you like my music, you don't like whatever. But that was my philosophy with Kashmir. So the next thing that, that kind of leads me to is, uh, what is your story? And I think story is at the heart of all great art and all great artists. And I think having something to say is actually a lot more important than technical skill. And G6, for instance, that song, I mean, is pretty cheesy now, to be honest. Uh, but at the time, it was innovative. And at the time, it was sort of this merging of dance music and, and hip hop music. And it was like, oh man, there's all this bad stuff about this. It's like out of keys. It's, any, I would probably fix that song to, to the point now, if I was producing it, where I'd fuck it up and it'd probably not even be a hit. It wouldn't even be the song that, that it was. Uh, but it was the idea. I think the idea was original, and that's, in my uh, history, I, I look back and that's always served me better. When I came uh, with the novel idea and executed that, as opposed to just a display of technical skill. And there was a song that, uh, that I helped produce also called Tsunami, and that was uh, the same idea 
The idea was I wanted to look at the DJ like he was this military leader leading this army of, of uh, people in the crowd. I saw it in this unique way. And I was sort of still an outsider of dance music then, so I could kind of look at it and like, oh, it looks like he's like a fucking, you know, uh, some kind of, yeah, military warlord that's leading these people into uh, battle. And originally, Tsunami actually, uh, before the drop, it said, this is Sparta! And then the <laughs> drop uh, happened, but we later changed that to, uh, to Tsunami. Anyway, that's just an example. I think a novel idea is uh, more important than uh, technical skill. Um, another thing about telling a story, I hear this get thrown around a lot that, oh, is this relatable? Am I making something that's uh, relatable or does it sort of fit what's going on? I think that's total bullshit. I think when you think about an artist, you're not really interested in uh, if you can relate to them. You're interested in their story because their story is not like your boring fucking life. It's something new and it's something interesting and that's what you should be giving people. That should be your whole goal as an artist, to give people something that doesn't exist yet, some insight into who you are. Not if they can relate to you. People sit around, especially when they're writing lyrics or songwriters, oh, but people, can people relate to this? Oh, I just want to shoot them in the face. Because they just come up with the same generic stuff all the time. Because they keep compromising. And that's, uh, that's something you have to avoid. Um, but yeah, okay, so this kind of goes on what I was saying. Don't look at what's happening in the music scene. Look at what's not happening and what's missing that you have. And for me, with my project with Kashmir, at the time when I started it, um, big guys were like a Vici, all these Dutch guys with the same haircut and everything was happy and it was just like this really, you know, uh, euphoric sort of music. And I thought a really cool counter to that would uh, be something dark and sort of cinematic and sort of like the anti-hero to, uh, to the scene. My whole sound has changed a lot since then, but that was the original uh, idea. And I think that's uh, a good takeaway to see what's going on, and whereas other people see what's going on and try to do the same thing, see where there's a kind of a gap there that like on a human level, you know people would like, but on the surface level is uh, missing. That's kind of uh, another goal, I think, as an artist that'll help you. Um, about your music story, I think your music should tell a story, not like a literal show. I mean, we're making dance music, let's not get ahead of ourselves, you know, we make a lot of instrumental music. But I think that if you make dance music, even instrumental dance music, with sort of a story in mind that you're picturing, you'll have a conviction that the listener will hear. And for me, dance music, why I love it, and why finally, you know, back when I was young, I was just into hip hop and dance music, it seems super cheesy to me. Um, and then them even said, nobody listens to techno. And I'm like, oh, totally. You're totally right, nobody listens to this shit. And the reason I fall, uh, fell in love with dance music is because I started to see the story. I hear this whole instrumental track, six minute song, and I just picture this whole story in my head. Now the guy who made the song, maybe he's not seeing the same story as me, I'm not seeing the same story as him, but if you make music in that way, it will somehow come through. That's what I found. Uh, so yeah, good melodies uh, tell a story and Secrets, I have the, uh, this melody from Secrets here popped up and I was gonna tell you about how that kind of makes me see a story and I'll, maybe I'll do that later if there's time. I'm gonna point on it. Um, things that will help you as an artist. Um, it can be really hard to understand yourself. Um, I think, no, I, like, I don't know how people get it right the first time. I had the cataracts, and I got to figure out when I started Kashmir everything that I didn't want to do. Because I think that's really important. When you're deciding who you are, almost more than the things you can list as defining you, having a big list of things you won't do, you're not going to do some cheesy bullshit. You're not going to do, you know, uh, 128 like the rest of I do 128. Every year I have to do 128. You got to decide what you're not going to do that's almost as important as having an identity so that you don't fall in line with everyone else. Because the second someone gives you a little attention, if you haven't had it before, you're going to be so quick to do whatever they think is best for you. Oh, you're going to put out my song and spin it or whatever. Well, okay, you want me to make this because this is hot right now? I'll do it. Fuck that. Have a big list of things that you won't do and stick with that. That's an identity. That's at least the start of an identity right there. Um, uh, listen to your friends. Another thing about, uh, you know, I said it's hard to sort of understand yourself. A lot of us 
want to be a certain person. We have idols, we want to emulate them, that's okay. That isn't going to reveal what makes you special though. And the way that you can reveal what makes you special, you can have your friends around you. And while you're busy trying to mimic the people that you look up to, you might just accidentally make something totally unique and awesome. And having your friends around you, in my experience, has been really beneficial because they'll stop me and they'll say, no, don't fix that. You're trying to fix that, make it sound like something that you've heard before. Leave it as it is. That's a beautiful accident. And you should leave it like that. And then, you know, with the G6 song, it's the same way. I have my friends with me and I probably would have changed that song if it wasn't for them. So thank, uh, uh, yeah, I thank them for my house and my car and everything else like that. Um, if somebody says, uh, yeah, so yeah, listen to the feedback. The universe really does have a way of letting you know when you're doing what it wants. You start getting more plays, people will start answering your emails. When you stumble upon what connects about you, it will just, you just gotta wait. And if you're not getting it yet, you probably suck, you know? I mean, you gotta accept that you're gonna suck for a long time, or you're just gonna suck in the sense that you really haven't figured out who you are, and that's not coming true uh, quite yet. You will see other artists get big and not understand why. That's okay. Don't let that confuse you. Don't see guys putting a helmet on and making a big career out of it. No, that's not this to anybody or anything. But don't let that confuse you and make you rethink your whole identity. Other people will get successful. You're not gonna like their music. You won't understand why. Fuck it. Seek to understand yourself and better communicate yourself and your music. Your fans will come. You might have a million fans, you might have a thousand, ten thousand fans. You'll have zero fans if you're nobody, if you have nothing that you stand for. But you could die happy having the fans that you deserve by being yourself. And those fans will stick with you, too. Okay, things that will help you as an artist. Uh, try making songs with original vocals as soon as possible. I've made a lot of different tracks. Some of them have been instrumental, some of them have had vocals. The ceiling on the songs that I've done with vocals is so much higher with uh, Secrets and Wildcard and tracks like that. Those of uh, G6, those songs just have a higher ceiling. And I think a lot of producers, because what we do is so geeky and solitary, um, one reason that we're attracted to producing is because we don't have to socialize. We can just be in front of a computer and make all the song ourselves, you know, and it kind of plays into our like anti-social introverted tendencies, which I have a lot of. Uh, but you should force yourself to start getting original vocals and to do that you need to reach out to songwriters and people who sing songs and they probably want to work with you just as bad as you want to work with them. You know, look for people who have an amazing voice um, but just don't have a big song yet. You have to do a little work to do that but it's absolutely worth it. Um, okay, so that's one thing. Totally unrelated. Imitating is okay at first. I think imitating is okay. Uh, style and confidence, those will grow through every little thing that you learn and adopt and in the process of making mistakes, you will find your own personality. I do think emulating is okay. To this day, I'll get, uh, I use Ableton, and I'll get templates for Ableton and I'll study, uh, you know, new tracks that come out and try to learn what they do to this day. And I'll even from the template, I'll steal like, I'll be like, you know what, that fucking 16 bar build up, I can see you making it for an hour or I could just take the one from the template and add a few things and I still do that to, uh, to this day. Okay, so the next thing, I'm just really going quick here. I got 45 minutes. Uh, is everyone having fun? Is this good? Yeah. yeah. Okay, all right. all right. When it comes to music theory, I had a whole bunch of other shit written down, with Roman numerals and stuff. I deleted it all because you want to hear about that. You're not gonna remember that. Uh, it would just be like a jerk off session for people who already know it. Uh, I learned everything online. Uh, try these sites, Hook Theory and Courthouse. Hook Theory is unbelievable. You take, it has every big song that's out and they break it down into the chords. They just show you the most important part, which is the chords and then the melody. And you just get to see what made your favorite song, what made a big song, what made a catchy song. You just get to see it and learn from that. It's an amazing site. Don't be intimidated by music theory. All chords are just based on three notes. You know, there's seven notes in a scale. It's not, you know, it's not that. I mean, I say that, but seriously, for pop music, it's not that hard. Um, song structure, you know, this is getting a little geeky. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was gonna talk a little bit. Uh, okay, I'll tell you what, I got, 
I have a few things I could show you. I probably don't have time enough for all of them. I could show you like the kind of structure, melodic structure of that song, Secrets I did with Tiesto. Uh, I have the uh, part of Carry Me Home, it's my song that I have in Ableton to show you that stuff. And I have the drop from a Power pulled up in Ableton. You know, a song with it with Hardwell. Does anybody in particular like any of those? If I was to pick one, Power. 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 Power? Power. Okay, of course, we're in Europe. I'm like, dun 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 dun. Not too, uh, this is a box right here. Um, okay, so I'll just quickly go over some, before I open that project, some of the uh, advice that I would have for just creating development in your tracks. So we're getting a little bit into the production side of thing. Um, introducing low end and high end are often your biggest tools for development, meaning, if you start without sub, and then you introduce the sub, if you start without high end and you introduce that, this seems obvious, but the real trick is to not blow your load and give those things away, and to always be building up into the next thing. And that is sort of how you get out of like the loop problem where people get stuck in just working on the same four bar loop to get into the sort of macro structure of it, which is to have things that are evolving and it's, you know, there's a lot to it, but it can sort of be simplified as uh, low end and high end. The mid is, is sort of always there, but uh, introducing those frequencies are often your most powerful tools as a producer. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a big difference, blah, blah, blah. The other tools that you have are uh, rhythmic notes and sustained notes. So you could have a da 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 da, or you could have a sustained chords. Another thing is you could have a, like a, harmonic pace where the chords are moving at a certain speed, they're changing once every two bars, and then in the next section they're changing every half a bar. That's how you create good development. If, if you know, I hope uh, that makes sense. Okay, mixing. So this is a, I made this. <laughs> I really did, I made a, yeah. That's great. All right. I don't think I made this metaphor up really. But I did make this on Photoshop, and I'm pretty proud of it. So think of mixing as a painting. Um, so from, on the y-axis, you have your frequencies, right? So you got low frequencies, you got high frequencies, right? And on the stereo field, things are on the left, or the center, or the right. Really, the center, you have two speakers. So what's the center? Does everyone kind of know what the center is when the same thing's playing out of both speakers? Your brain is tricked into thinking that it's in the middle if they're identical on the left and the right, right? God, you guys are fucking talking it, huh? Um, <laughs> volume and uh, reverb. So that is the Z axis. And what that means is something's far in the back if it's low in volume and it has a lot of reverb. Reverb is basically all the reflections that it's made before it got to your ears, right? So it's farther away from you, there's gonna be more reverb. And uh, similarly, if there's less reverb, it will sound like more in your face. Like if I whisper something in the ear, it's not gonna be much reverb that you hear. So volume and reverb are sort of how you push things uh, to the front. Now, where this gets interesting is, if you look at that box as the canvas, we all have the same canvas. We max out at zero decibels. But some tracks sound louder and better, and some tracks don't, and they can both be uh, hitting zero decibels, peaking at zero. Right? The way that you really make things uh, sound big is relative. It's relativity, and I drew that little man on the mountain. All of a sudden, he made that mountain look like just a little pile of shit or something, right? Because he is too big. That can't be a mountain, or he's a giant. Or so something's <laughs> off about that. So the thing in your song that you wanted to be a mountain now feels like a little hill because you put this sort of unnecessary thing, a thing that wouldn't make your mountain look big, you, you put that there. Now those little birds in the upper left hand, they make your mountain look big. And they're also in the high frequencies, and they're a little bit left, so they're out of the way of the mountain. Okay, does that kind of make sense? You can look at these as sounds that are sort of out of the way of one another. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Okay. Right, so that's how we can make things sound louder and better, although we're only afforded the same canvas. We all get the same canvas, but you can make things uh, sound better and bigger, and you can space them out. Now for a nice painting, not everything just needs to be totally separate. Things can blend in, 
if everything is totally separate, it wouldn't really look like a real painting because it's like uh, nothing's living in the same world. Like that light is not separate from me. It bounces off of me and it changes my skin tone. You, things need to be interacting with one another. I don't think you need to overdo it with total, complete, categorical, you know, separation of everything. You just want to be mindful that if the idea is to get people to hear these four elements, if you place them, keeping that in mind, they will hear it. It's hard to say what's good or bad, but if you want people to hear things, this is a good visual representation of why they might not be hearing the thing, or why the thing that you feel like is important, like your kick or whatever, doesn't come through as important. And the other thing is, over time, uh, you might have a kick and a bass. Those things should both be in the song, no doubt. You should have a bass, you should have a kick, but that sounds like an ugly picture because it would all be along the bottom uh, end of the frequencies, the bottom of our mountain, the kick and the bass. So you also have a painting that can change over time. And you do that with side chain, where the kick happens, and then the kick gets out of the way, and then the bass comes in. So you can have a painting that doesn't just change to X, Y, and Z, but it changes through uh, time, of course. Uh, uh, yes, quantum physics and uh, all that stuff. No, we're just making uh, EDM music for we can. Basic advice. Uh, the perfect sound. Fuck the perfect sound. Well, this is just me. Because I got a lot of geeky friends who can sound design well, but really can't make a sound, uh, song. And it's like someone with a huge vocabulary who get, you can't bring to parties because they have no idea how to hold the conversation. I know a lot of people who are really good at designing, like the perfect sound, they're really brainy about it, but uh, don't make a lot of songs, you don't make a lot of good songs. Honestly, I go through presets. By the end of a song, you know, my personality and my artistry is going to come out by the 1,000, 10,000 decisions I made before the song is done. And there's so many decisions, and in the end, you get me. You get a representation of me. If you get hung up on thinking that this particular sound you need to design because the whole thing's not gonna be you if you don't design for, they're just little sounds. I would hope you have a bigger vision that's more than just this sit, this bass, you know, or this lead or whatever. You has gotta be a little more complex uh, than just these little sounds and whether you use the preset. And that's why I think if you need a pluck, just go grab a pluck from a, a piece of library, whatever, who cares? In the end, that puck is gonna be a very small piece that serves the function to your greater vision, okay? So don't worry about the perfect sound. Keep it simple. A lot of sounds have a cool character and are interesting, and they get very uninteresting when you layer them with three, four other things. Suddenly, it just sounds like a mess. So keeping it simple, right? Kind of obvious. Trust your ear. People say trust your ear, but everybody has ears and a lot of them suck at making music. So learn the tools, learn your tools, so when you say it's bad, when you know it's bad, you know why. Because that's the difference between a good producer and a normal person. Normal people know when they like something and they don't like it. Your job as a producer is to know why, so that you can recreate good things and you can avoid uh, future mistakes. So yeah, yeah sure, Trust your ear, that's true, but you definitely need to train your ear and you gotta understand how to get the results you need. It's just as important. Go easy on your brain. This is a, this is a trick that I use a lot now where uh, I'll take a project that's become you know full of hundreds of tracks and it's got a drop and it's got a break and it's got a build up and I'll separate these into two or sometimes even three projects to make it easier on my brain. So the drop now is only 12 tracks and uh, what that does is, it makes you think creatively again. Like in the beginning, when you first started that project, you were thinking creatively. And then when it got to 100 tracks, you're just juggling this math equation in your head. And uh, you probably, in a lot of cases, you just wanna start something new, because you're like, fuck, that just sounds like such a hassle to have to go through that thing and to finish it. So you might even avoid it completely. So uh, to, to, to avoid letting good songs die and to keep your brain fresh and imaginative and creative, uh, go easy on it. Understand that you and your brain are like two different things. You want something to happen. Your brain is this muscle that is gonna help you or not if you, if you treat it right. So that helps to simplify things for uh, your brain. Okay. Woo! How was that?
So, okay, so everyone said power. Let me load up. Load up power. Then we can take questions. You can tell me what you want to talk about. I'll tell you why I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is, this is power. Uh, <laughs> okay, that is power. top it's got this uh got a little bit of kick what am i doing got a little pro cue just being a total ignoramus and just boosting a little end on there that's what's going on with the kick i want to uh symbols one thing that i've learned about making drops although it can be very tempting to just like put the symbols on everything and claps and everything do try to support your takeaway message which is your lead melody. I really don't care for most EDM music that doesn't have a melody at the center of it. And making your drop communicate your melody as powerfully as possible is for me the uh, sort of utmost goal. So, okay, that comes out in those small subtle sort of ways, like the cymbal. So it's subtle, but it is choosing to follow it instead of being relentless on every beat, right? Okay, so there we go. So far, we just got a kick and a cymbal. Next thing is sub. And this is just like, what is this? This is like, yeah, it's just a saw waveform and it's like really low pass. And we got volume shaper. I like volume shaper. It's a good, uh, should I change plug in? That's boring, huh? Um, Bass. So we had the sub. I'm a big fan of bending bass notes because they always sort of yank you into the next thing. That's a really uh, easy trick. So here we have the chords. It looks like we're going C sharp, C, F, C, back to C. And we have these crazy ass bends going between everything. And that really helps. Um, yank you between each thing. I think between that and to use little reverse sounds will help keep your drop uh, interesting. Um, it can be the glue oftentimes. So, okay, so we've got the bass. We have uh, a main note song called Back To Me. And I was lazy, I just took the white noise in there. What the hell is white noise you know. Um, I have this leads bus, which is taking all the leads at once. I have this really high. It gives you all the noise. I know we were talking about noise and how important that is. Oftentimes, if your drop sounds kind of uninteresting, you can add just like a layer of white noise and that might do the trick. Um, on the leads bus, let's see. We just got a little bit of a cue, just cutting off to the lows. We have, uh, so what is this, LFO tool, the volume shaper as well. I don't know why I need two side chains. Who knows? Um, so we have, another thing that comes up, I don't know how many of you use Ableton? A lot of you guys. Um, I would be conscious of the fact that Ableton's timing can get off. 10 minutes, okay. Uh, Ableton's timing can get off, especially when you have a lot running into it and to, uh, to feed in MIDI into your volume shaper or LFO tool or whatever, we'll keep it on time. Uh, the way that I'm doing that here is I took this MIDI that's playing on a beat like that, and then the MIDI gets routed to the volume shaper and the LFO tool, and that keeps it on time. 
Okay, anyway, small little fucking whatever. There is a harmony also. So all together are leads between, look, it's really simple, just a little white noise kind of soft thing mixed with this, it's kind of like a throaty lead, and then you have these harmonies, yeah, all that sound, oh, it's a side chunky, that's right, all right. So, yeah, you have this little, uh, these dirty basses, one of them is more mid. This guy's give you a little more of the high end. Right? Well, it's an EDM drop. What do you expect, guys? I mean, it's, you know. Yeah. But it's the melody that counts. It really is the, the melody that, um, that counts. There's just not enough time to explain my what melodies, what makes a good melody. I have philosophy on that, but not 10 minutes worth of uh, philosophy. What about questions? Good questions. Anybody got questions? Yeah, you. Yeah, uh, what do you see from people that you think, wow, this, this guy shouldn't be doing this, or this girl is doing this wrong? Like, what's the number one thing that you like, oh, he, he or she should take Huh, oh, like the music production? Yeah, the music production. Um, I think we're sort of in an era now where we're just making, like, a cool track, like a cool beat that you could play at a club without any kind of bigger vision is becoming more and more futile. You know, like I just, EDM's in a weird space. I mean, it's kind of thriving because like I still go to like festivals, perform at festivals, still have great turnouts, but it doesn't seem to be like a lot of doors opening for new guys to rise up. It's like a lot of the same guys I feel like I kind of just barely got in uh, the door at the last second with that. So I, I think to just make little bangers, it's hard to imagine a way up with that. And that's why I put a little bit of emphasis on the, the vocal thing and start thinking about making songs, you know? Uh, yeah. Oh, hope that helps. Anybody else? Sure. Well, yeah, look at us, man. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. you got picked. Sorry, you're fucked. <laughs> hey, I've, I've seen your tutorials online, awesome stuff, so thanks for sharing. Uh, when you're not touring, can you talk about your normal routine in terms of studio time when you go in, your workflow process, your, a little bit about your creative process? Yeah, sure. It's extremely unhealthy. Um, I have my studio set up in my bedroom. Um, my girlfriend and my ex-girlfriend, not big fans of that. Um, I, I, you know, I, I just, I get up, I avoid working for as long as I can before guilt sets in, and then around, <laughs> honestly, and uh, around like 3 p.m. or something, I start, I start working, and I, I try to uh, come up with some sort of game plan for myself. <laughs> Because once I get into work and the caffeine or you know whatever I'm taking and try to get me amped up kicks in, I can get very tunnel vision. So I try to make clear-headed Niles create a, a bit of a plan for himself. And, you know, we see how it goes. Sometimes I stick with it. Sometimes I, you know, deservedly follow an idea that that's just really exciting. Uh, but yeah, as whenever I'm home, I ain't doing much. I'm just working on music pretty much. And now I do have a girlfriend, so gotta make sure she doesn't leave me, and I gotta hang out with her. And uh, you know, I have to. I'm still learning how to be a good boyfriend. Well, I love her a lot, so it's not that hard. But um, but you know, yeah, I guess that's pretty much it. I uh, I I almost force myself to you know try to get up, go to the gym, or go outside, because that stuff helps also uh, be creative. You know, to get a little bit of physical exercise. But man, it's tough. I mean, going out on the road and playing all these shows, I get it, I know. Um, uh, and then you gotta, you gotta, sorry. Sorry, not, sorry, sorry. Uh, 
Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's fucking tough, man. I mean, I, I'll tell you one thing that helped me a lot. In the first year that I did Cashmere, I didn't, I didn't show my face. And I had a really big advantage there. Because uh, I was just making new music, you know, for a year and a half. And DJs, you know, you, you're out on the road, you're making money, and it seems like everything's peachy, you know? You show up to a club every night, everyone knows your name, you're the star of the night. You're like, oh, life is pretty good. But you're not making new music, or, or that's the, you know, that's the, that's the, uh, that's a pitfall, is that you cannot really be making new music, and everything about your artistry is just sort of crumbling as you go from, you know, this guy saying nice things, this guy, I'm gonna try publicity, he's gonna give me some money to DJ, and everyone's saying nice things, I'm doing really well, you live in a fucking fantasy, you know? And then you go home and you're super tired, juggling it is hard, and you start to, you know, you start to believe the hype of everyone at every club who's telling you that you're the star of that night. And, uh, you know, just as much as you, um, you shouldn't listen to the haters or people who try to disparage you or tell you something about, you should be very careful listening to people who give you too much praise. I would say, it's, 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 I, would, I would give. Yeah. Hey man, um, I can't even imagine, like, we get this how much of a superstar you are. There is literally like outside, like this whole, like hundred people still outside. So Could you just not use the microphone because they can't? <laughs> <laughs> there are like, like hundred people still waiting outside to get in. That tells you like how big a superstar you are. Oh, thank I want to ask you like how was that transition from Camerax to Kashmir, uh, becoming one of the biggest business in the world? And can you also give us three golden tips for every producer and every upcoming artist? Yeah, I tell you, it was a big leap of faith to start Kashmir. When I told my managers, we have found the good, you know, financially found some success in the cataract. And it was obviously dwindling out, but uh, people are often scared to, make, to, to abandon something that's making everybody money. Uh, so it was a big leap of faith. It was just really me following my heart. I had this sense of impending doom. Like, I'm going to stick to this thing until the Titanic really sinks. And then I'm not gonna be able to live with myself, you know? So I started uh, Kashmir and I just, almost, I kind of faked the confidence. I looked at all my whole team in the eyes. I said, this is really gonna work. I believe in it. And I'm pretty sure they were faking it too when they looked at me and they said, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was the same team. I stuck with those guys. Those guys, when I first met them, really didn't know the first thing about music management. And I love him. I mean, my tour manager, he doesn't know, he didn't know the first thing about tour managing. He was just my friend from back home. Uh, I have a, I might, you might say it's a problem. I hire a lot of my friends. It sucks because I can't fire them. Um, not easily anyway, you know. Um, and trust me, I've wanted to. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, other, the great thing is, is that you, you get, you're surrounded by friends also. I mean, if you're going to be doing this every day, some guy you found on Craigslist, I don't know if you use here, but some guy you found on Craigslist or whatever, it's gonna suck, you know? So uh, your friends will be loyal to you, they'll stay up with you late into the night. If when you're excited about a song and you need someone to hang out with you in the studio at 4 a.m., they might just do it, you know? Because they, they're really invested, just like you are, you know? So that's a good thing, I forgot uh, the rest of it. Three, two, three tips? Yeah, three golden tips. Yeah, three golden tips. <laughs> what, these weren't good? These, <laughs> these yeah. Fuck, man, I spent an hour to have one of these tips. Um, oh shit, uh, three, three golden, uh, three golden tips. Well, I think, um, I was watching your, uh, this, uh, well, what was it, Defiant Ones with Jimmy Iveen and Dr. Dre? He has something that's really powerful and something that I struggle with also. We talked about horses when they're doing the races, how they put these helmets on them. Uh, so that they don't look to the side of the other horses and psych themselves out. You know, it doesn't matter what this guy's doing or what that guy's doing. You gotta remember what you came for, what, you, what you're here to do. And it's tough, you know, because you'll put out something you think was gonna be so great and no one gives a shit about it, you know, and then some other guy's doing something that's doing really well and you think, ah, you know, you won't let your brain, your brain, you know, you won't let your brain say, just copy that guy, but it'll start coming in to the decisions you're making, you start making decisions. You start compromising yourself a little bit. Um, if you're gonna do music, uh, 
I just make the last two into this one last tip. If you're gonna do music, just don't compromise. Don't take a fucking poll every time you're gonna make a decision about what the best lyrics should be or which version of the drop you should do. You know, live and die by your own sword. You might not get all the fans, but you'll get the fans the universe intended for you and the fans you deserve. And hey, if you're a really uninteresting piece of shit person, then maybe you deserve zero fans, and that's what you'll get, you know? But my gut tells me, like you seem like a decent guy who has an interesting story to tell, if you just find the right way to package that, hone your skill so that you can package it correctly, you'll find the fans that you deserve, and you'll, you'll have a good career, you'll be happy that you're in the music. You know, you won't wake up every day like, man, this is just another job, you know? Cause I see people in music that do that. It's like another nine to five, man. I was one of those people. Trying to come and wake up every day, come up with a pop song, hip hop song, you know? Fuck that, you know? Now I got something that at least I could cry, you know? I think about my grandpa and I play, there's one song in particular, John Moo, and every time I play it, now I pass away and I think of him. And I almost cry every time I'm on stage, you know? It means something to me. So I'll be up there with my eyes closed. I don't even look at the crowd. I'll just be up there to dance with my ass off, thinking about him. You know, that's what I signed up for. That's the hero in my movie that I saw when I was a kid. You know, we all have to compromise a little bit. We don't all get to be the hero, but you try. You try. You know, do not let the kid version of you down. That's my advice. Yeah, sure. You had a question, right? Can I just get one more question? I, I really uh, can't this. Um, how you can learn? How can you learn about? Uh, you use the internet, internet. Yeah. yeah. So, like a splice. Splice is great. Yeah. Splice is attachment. Do a little YouTube <laughs> part. <laughs> hey, they're good. Um, yeah, I would say master class. I didn't like master class. I signed up for one of those. Um, I do. Uh, there are a lot of good YouTube tutorials, and the kids who recreate these EDM songs, fucking weird. I mean, I'm like, man, you're really just spending all this time just recreating a song. You know, there's a lot of that now. But they're really good at it now, and it's cool to see. You know, it's it's the closest you'll get to be like, see, you know, seeing how some of your favorite songs got made. So like, I'm really not above it. I'll go watch some kids' random ass YouTube tutorial with like 500 views on it, and like, study it, and sit there and try to figure out. But yeah, the internet is uh, it's got it, everything you need and porn. So you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.